Well, I, I'm, I mean, it, if that doesn't, it doesn't get any better than that, but it does. Uh, we have a guest preacher with us today, uh, Lance Hurley, again, uh, executive director of Ignite Church Planting. Uh, he has been a spiritual and pastoral me uh, mentor of mine. He's a great friend of mine, and he's also a great friend of Journey Church. Give him a round of applause uh, to Lance. And I really do love my job. I get to see all kinds of exciting things all the time, and it's a lot of fun. And it's a lot of fun doing this, being in front of you today. So thank you so much for being the church you are. You know, uh, 10 years ago, uh, Steve and Amy Joe came to, uh, came to this region, and God has blessed this region because of them, hasn't he? Yeah, yeah. And God's blessed the region because of this church. And so thank you for being the church you are. And you are a parent church because you have a baby inside of you. How about that? Huh? All right. <laughs> That's good stuff, guys. That is good stuff. By the way, there are 30 to 40,000 people who speak Farsi in Chicagoland. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, we've got a, we've got a lot of jobs ahead of us, and we're going to plant more Farsi churches, aren't we, brother? Yes, we are. Okay. Well, it's good to be here with you today. And I thought I'd start with an experience I had a few summers ago, because I thought a summer story would be a good way to start on a nice winter day, wouldn't it? So it was 4th of July weekend. And my wife and I, Darla, were out fishing with our daughter-in-law and grandchildren down where they live around Urbana. We found a good shady spot by the, by the lake. And it wasn't long before the bobbers were out in the, in the lake just bobbing along. We were waiting for the fish to start biting. And that's when my daughter-in-law spotted it. It was a snake. A snake was swimming around the water. And we'd never seen a snake there when we fished before. I thought, okay, this is a new experience. And so the snake would just swim around in front of where we were fishing. And, uh, and I'd poke at it with my rod because I was trying to rile it up a little bit. I tried to flip it up. I couldn't get it up on the bank. And so I, anyway, so uh, my daughter-in-law said, what are you doing? And I said, I just want to flip it up on the bank. She said, don't do that. So anyway, we were just playing around. And I, I pushed it away. And finally, it looked like the snake left. And so, uh, so we, would, uh, we would fish along. And... And all of a sudden, the snake came back. And the snake would swim up, and he'd stick his head up above the water, and he'd kind of go like this, which is really kind of cool. And my, my grandson said to me, Grandpa, that's an Egyptian viper. And I said, no, it's not. <laughs> okay. And he said, well, what is it? I said, I don't know. He was five. He said, I don't know what it is, but I know it's not an Egyptian viper, buddy. Okay, so anyway, so we, finally it looked like the snake left. And so we were catching a little pan fish, you know, about this big or so. And we were fishing, and all of a sudden, my wife, Darla, she said, the snake. And sure enough, she had started to catch a fish. And the, and the fish was, well, she was reeling it in, and the snake had latched onto the fish. And so the snake, I looked down the water, the snake about had about half the fish in its mouth. And I said, reel him in, reel him in. And so she started reeling the snake in, and the snake was coming, and all of a sudden he let go of the fish. And I could have swear it sounded like this. Okay, and out came that fish flying toward my wife. Now, I'm standing there, and this fish goes flying past me, and she screams at the top of her lungs. My daughter-in-law screams at the top of her lungs, and I'm laughing as hard as I could because it was the funniest thing I'd ever seen. You see, my wife doesn't scream except when there's mice involved, and now I know it's flying snakes, okay? So anyway, so we're, we're there, and, uh, and Crystal said, well, I guess snakes in the water really do creep me out. And Darla said, I just thought the snake was flying right at my face. Well, the next day I got online, because I wanted to see what kind of snake this was. And it turned out it was one of two things. It was either a brown-banded water snake, or it was a water moccasin, otherwise known as a cotton mouth, which are poisonous. So I said to my wife when she got home from work today, so, okay, honey, I got a great question for you, but depending on what, what you saw. I said, when that snake was flying toward you with his mouth open, was it white? And she said, stop. Now, I'll be married 40 years in May, and when she says stop, you know what I do? No, I stop. Come on. Come on. I'm smart, okay? I've been married before. I'm okay. So I tell you that story, though, as a setup for what we're going to look at today, okay? The subject is something we're all familiar with, and that's why the topic or the, the title of the message today is An Encounter We All Share. To set it up with, I brought, since we talked about fishing to start with today, I brought my fishing lure, okay? Now, it looks very nice, okay? Okay? Very attractive to a fish. It's 
allure. And the story of the snake is also very appropriate to the story we're going to look at today. Let's look at the verse we're going to, we're going to examine. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says this. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. When you are tempted, he will also provide a way out for you so you can stand up under it. Now, Paul wrote this verse to the church at Corinth. And he wrote this in a passage that looked back at the Jewish history. And basically, he said, there have been times throughout your history as Jewish people that you were tempted. And here's the problem. Over and over again, they fell into the temptation, and they fractured their relationship with God. Now, the Bible book of Corinthians was written to people who lived in the Grecian city of Corinth, a city of about 250,000 people at that point in time. And it was a city that was highly immoral. In fact, the, the term to Corinthianize basically meant to practice sexual immorality. So the town was known for that type of practice. And the church was plagued with all kinds of problems. If you want to read it, read the earlier part of the book, all kinds of problems in this church. Now, Paul said, looking at the history of the people who tried to follow God, the Israelites, he said, listen, what happened in the past does not need to happen, to continue to happen now in the present. And here's why. And that's what I want to explore together today. There is a way to defeat an enemy that we all face. The enemy is temptation. Now this verse tells us we all share it in common. Have you ever been tempted? <laughs> okay, I have too. All the time. Okay, it never leaves. Now, I want you to know something. Temptation is not sin. Okay? Temptation is not sin. Uh, we're all going to be tempted, but just because we face temptation doesn't mean we need to embrace temptation. It's what we do with temptation that determines our relationship with God. Temptation is a reality. We're going to be tempted by all kinds of things, to lie about something, to make us look better in the face of others. You know, to, to take something that isn't ours, to talk about somebody behind their backs, to do something we know isn't right. We're all tempted all the time. And temptation looks good. It's always dressed up. Think of Adam and Eve, okay, when the serpent tempted them, Satan that back in the Garden of Eden, takes them to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and he shows them the fruit. And here's what we're told. The fruit looked good. It was pleasing to the eye. Now, the trouble with temptation is that there's always a hook embedded in it. And we know that. And yet it still looks enticing. See what the verse says? No temptation has seized you. The word for temptation comes from the word for experience. See, the enemy is sneaking. He, he puts these things in front of us that cause us to wonder, what might it be like? What might it be like to take a step into that? I, I read a story about a, a drug enforcement group in Tennessee, Nashville, Tennessee, that gave in to the temptation of stealing the drug money that they had seized in some of the busts they'd had. And it began very small with small incremental amounts, but it finally grew to big audacious amounts, and they were caught. And, and you know how it all started? It all started the way temptation always starts. I wonder what it would be like. I know it. We all know it. It's the way it works. And what Paul's saying here is, it's a reality, and we all face it. And we may say to ourselves, man, this is something so strong, no one's ever faced this like I have. And what Paul's telling us is, no, 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 no. We all face them all the time, and everyone has been able to defeat it because of the promise that we're told. The problem with temptation is it can seize us. That's the problem with hooks. They catch everything. Okay, even paper clips. How about that? I couldn't do that again if I wanted to. Okay. Now I've I've threaded enough hooks for my grandchildren. 
to know that they're very catchy. Because you know what I've caught more than anything? Myself. Okay? I mean, I've caught hooks in my fingers all the time and thread them because they're sharp. And they catch. And they dig in. And they make all kinds of problems with your clothes. Okay? They just really do. They really do. And that's what we're told here. Temptation seizes us. It holds on. It grips us. And it all begins with that first look at what seems to be attractive. Now, I lift weights with a buddy of mine. Uh, we've, we've lifted weights together for years. And we have a discipleship partnership. And we were talking about temptation uh, a, few, uh, a few months ago. And I said, do you know what tempts me? He said, what? I said, it's the girls at the gym. I said, I take a look. And then you know what I want to do? I want to take a second look. We talked about that. We talked about how to hold each other accountable for that because we need partners who can help us with temptation. See, there's the problem with temptation. It's always around. And we got we to gotta be on guard against it. See, the first look can take us to the first step if we're not aware. And Satan tempts us with the purpose of causing us to fall, to give in, to get us hooked to where we can't get out. So with that sobering thought, okay, he starts off that way, but then he says, I got a promise for you guys that you're going to love. No temptation to see you except what is common to man. And here's what Paul says, but God is faithful. Now, when I think of things that are faithful, I think of things like this. When you walk into a room and you flip the light switch on, what do you expect to happen? Tell me. Okay, you expect the lights to come on. Uh, when you t- go to your car and you put the key in or you push the button, what do you expect to happen? Okay. Now, would you be happy if your car started 92% of the time? Well, no, we would. We expect it to happen every time, right? Same thing with our, with our lights, okay? Now, we all know, though, that these things sometimes let us down. That's why they're not really a good, a good equa- equa- equation to what God really is because God is faithful all the time. He never lets us down. He never deserts us. He never walks away. And that's what Paul wants us to know here. Especially when you're tempted, God is faithful. He is there. And when temptation's trying to seize us, God's there to protect us. So what can we count on? Well, here's the promise, the first promise. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. I like that. I find comfort because I know that if temptation's trying to lure my attention, it doesn't need to beat me. I can be stronger than it. I can stand up under it. I need to remember that it is within my ability to say no. Now, I see this in a couple ways. First of all, there are plenty of, plenty of warnings that the Bible gives us that help us know what we don't want to step into, right? And, and they're written all over. And if we listen, God says, no, you don't want to do that because it's going to hurt. So I was, uh, I was uh, doing a children's sermon one time, a church I pastored for 19 years. I brought a bag out like this, and I said to the kids, I said, okay, I've got a loaded mousetrap in this bag. And I said, who wants to put their hand in it and find out if there's a mousetrap in it or not? And one kid goes, (laughs) I really didn't think anybody was going to say yes, okay? So I said, okay, Anwar, okay, wait, wait. So I'm telling you, there is a loaded mousetrap in here. Why would you want to put your hand in there? He said, I I don't think there's really a mousetrap in there. Said, okay. That's exactly what his eyes looked like. They got real big. I did that. I said, now listen, when the Bible tells us not to do something, you know what we need to do? Yeah, not do what the Bible tells us to do. Okay. Okay. There are plenty of warnings given us in the word of what we need to avoid. And how we don't want to step into certain things, okay? So, and that's very, we all face it, okay? We all face temptation. 
But the promise here is that when it comes our way, we are stronger than the temptation comes our way. Now, I may not be personally, but I have the Holy Spirit inside of me to direct me and give me the strength I need to say no. Does it work, though? Let me tell you a story. Just the other day, uh, the church I was pastoring, I was talking to the ministers there now, and he was telling me about several individuals, and and he said, there was one individual in particular, the name came up, and I have several stories about interactions with that individual, and I, I, started, I started to tell one of the stories. I said, let me, you know, this, let me tell you about something. And, and I started saying that, and all of a sudden I felt the Spirit say, you don't need to tell that story. And I stopped. And he said, uh, yeah, well, go ahead, go ahead. I said, no, no. Spirit just told me I don't need to say anything about that. If you can't say something good about somebody, don't say anything at all. So I'm going to listen. Hey, it worked that time. I could tell you all kinds of stories on the other side of things where it didn't work at all. Because I ran right through the stop sign. Okay? But every now and then, see the trouble with temptation, it's subtle and it's sneaky. So it can sneak up on us and we got we to get always stepping into it before we even realize where we are. And that's why it's very important to be on guard and know what our weaknesses are. And so when we feel something start to nudge us toward, we can say, no, 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 no. Listen, listen. Uh, Secondly, we can learn from past experiences of ourselves and others of the, the perils of stepping into temptation. This passage from James 1 tells the story of the sin cycle, how it works. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But everyone is tempted when by his own evil desire he is dragged away and enticed. And then after desire is conceived, he gives birth to sin. Sin when it is full grown gives birth to death. That's the way it works. We need to remember this. Okay? We, need to, we need to look down the road. And know that if we continue to step into this problem, this sin, it's going to drag us down. It could drag us under. So it helps to have a long view of things. And looking at the reality should cause us to hesitate before we step. I was, uh, I was hunting wild turkey a few years ago when I, I saw this lived out in front of me. I... Uh, I brought this beautiful girl out, had her sitting out on the edge of the field. You know what this is called? A decoy. A decoy. You know what, you know what, uh, what this is called, right? A lure. Isn't it, isn't it funny? Okay. So I set her out, and I began calling seductively. Okay. And before long, I heard a gobble about a quarter of a mile away. And then I could see him come out on the edge of the field. And then I saw his, his head stretch up. And I, began, so I saw him look, and he spotted her. And you know what he did? He started coming. And I told my brother-in-law, he's going to come right down to us. He's walking right down the fence line. Now, I had already figured out what the turkey was going to taste like. Okay? I had him bagged, Okay? But you see, there was a problem because he hung up about 50 yards away and then began to walk very slowly. toward. Because here's the way it usually works. The male gobbles and the female comes to him. That's the way it usually works. And she wasn't moving. And so he knew something wasn't quite right. Then that leads to the second promise we're given here. Because I, I really, I was looking forward to telling you the story about how when, when there's temptation coming our way, there's probably a 12-gauge pointed at us, okay? But here's the promise that we're told. When you are tempted, he will also provide a way out. so You can stand up under it, okay? So not only are we told the temptation is not stronger than we are, we're also promised there's an exit strategy. If we look, there's an escape hatch, an escape hatch means there's, there's a way out. Hey, you look at the back of the, the auditorium here, you see exit signs up there. You know exactly where to go if there's problems. It points the way. 
And if we look, we're told that there is a way out of any temptation that comes our way. I was listening to a minister one day talk about this, uh, talk about this word escape. It literally means step out. Instead of stepping in to the temptation, we step out. That's exactly what that turkey did. When he saw something wasn't right, instead of continuing to come toward me, thinking, eh, what if? No, no. He just escaped. He was gone. He was gone. Friends, we have an enemy. We have an enemy. He seeks to use temptation to pull us into dangerous settings that can disrupt our relationship with the Father. He laughs with joy when we continue to step toward danger instead of stepping out. And he loves us to listen to his voice instead of listening to the voice of the Father who says, no, 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 no. No, don't, don't step there. Don't go there. Hold on. But we don't have to listen to the enemy. We can listen to the Father. Because no temptation has seized you except what's coming. God is faithful. He doesn't let us be tempted beyond what we can bear. And there's an escape hatch. So what do we want to do? This next week, I want to encourage you to do several things. First of all, spend time listening to the voice of the Father. Okay? Because when we listen to his voice in the Word, I, I, I listen to the voice of the Father by reading the Bible. Okay? That's, that's how I hear him more often than anything. Okay? I try to read the Bible every day. I, I really do. And it helps me. So my encouragement would be to read a chapter of the Bible every day this week. If you you don't do this already, try it. Go to the book of Mark in the New Testament. Just read a chapter a day. You get to hear the voice of the Father. If you're already doing it, hey, keep doing what you're doing. You know it helps. Read what Jesus, read about Jesus. That's in Mark. And, And as you read, ask the Father to help you open your eyes and hearts to what he wants you to hear. Okay. Then secondly, temptation. It's going to come our way this week. Okay, it's going to. I don't know what form it's going to take for you. What tempts me may not tempt you at all, and vice versa, but you know it's going to come. When we put the Bible into our hearts regularly, here's what happens. We begin to hear the voice of the Father more clearly and more easily. And so when temptation comes your way, listen. Listen to the voice of the Father. Because it's a lot easier to step out early in the process than get farther into the process and then step out. Thirdly, if the warning bells go out, go off, don't ask questions, don't wait to see what's going to happen, step out. Period. Just step out. Okay? Don't hesitate. Run away. You don't want to get the hook buried. So look for the escape hatch. We're promised it's there. Now, guys, what happens if we fall into temptation? And we, get, we, we practice sin. What happens? Well, it will happen. Okay, it will. Here's where the grace of God comes into play. Okay? God loves us. He sent his son to die in our place, our sins are forgiven. That's why Jesus came for us. So if we sin, tell God you're sorry and get up, okay? Get up. Get back on the road, okay? That's just the way it works. That's the way it works. That's what he wants for us. And then maybe maybe the next time that temptation comes, you'll be a little wiser and you won't step into it quite so easily, okay? I love forgiveness, don't you? <laughs> okay, yeah, it's good stuff. So here's my challenge for you, okay? Let's try to win one this next week, okay? When temptation comes our way, let's try to win one, okay? A victory over this common enemy, we all face it, will breed more victories. That's the way it works too. And share your story with someone. When you win one, share it because this helps other people. It helps encourage others. And we can do it. We can do it because God is stronger than our enemy. And the Holy Spirit that lives in us, he lives in us, is stronger than anything Satan can ever bring against us. Okay? So let me pray for you. 
Father, I thank you so much for your promises. And I'm thankful that we can trust you to keep your promises for us. Uh, We count on you. We don't count on ourselves. We count on you. And we know that you can help us. So thank you for the powerful love you give to us. And thank you for Jesus, our Savior. It's in his name we pray now. Amen. Amen. I don't know if you had a chance, uh, if you're new here maybe or just forgot, but on the tables there are some communion cups. So if you'd like to go ahead and participate in communion, uh, make sure you can get up and grab one at this point. If not, that's okay too. But at Journey Church, we want you to know that you know communion is just another way for us to worship. Of course, uh, singing his praises is just one way to worship, hearing his word, reading his word. There's so many things we could do, but communion is really, I think, the ultimate way to praise and worship God and to let him know that you believe everything that happened on the cross was for you. And these cups, um, you know, they might just look like a little cup, but, you know, there is things that represent what Jesus did for us on the cross. And that cracker, of, of course, is the bones that Jesus and his body that broke for us, and it was painful and awful. And then, of course, there's the blood that he shed for us in this cup, and the juice represents that as well. So what we're going to do this morning is really kind of whatever you want to do. You can close your eyes, lift your heads, lift your hands. Don't do anything. Just listen. Think about your week. Think about people you need to forgive, people that maybe made you mad, but you need to let go of that. Temptation, of course, is something that we all face on a daily basis. Think about that. Think about your blessings and all the things, and maybe you need answers. And I said earlier in the service, I needed a big answer for something. And you know what? God did give me that sign, and he told me to go for it. And I did it, and I feel good about it. And you know what? He's giving me reassurance that I even made the right decision already. But, you know, you can even take it home. You don't even have to do this today. You can do it at home, whenever you want, just between you and God, the two of you. But as we sing this next song, it's called The Goodness of God. Close your eyes, take your communion, don't take your communion, pray, whatever it is you want to do. This is a time between you and God to worship just the two of you. But this song does mean a lot to me. It's a song that's one of my favorites among many, and it's called The Goodness of God. Because you know what? All my life, you have been faithful. And he continued will. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God I love your voice You have led me through the fire and the darkest night. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. Oh, I have lived in the goodness of God. the goodness of God. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I 
goodness goes beyond words. There's so many things that describe you, Father, but love stands out in my mind this morning. The love you have for us, Father, is there, and it's evident, and it's forever. For those who accept you, in the name of Jesus, amen. Good morning, Journey Church. Thank you for joining us today. How many of you have connected with Journey Church today? Raise your hand. For all of you that didn't raise your hand, reach forward and grab that Connect card and get connected today. God has equipped us all for his works. When we serve the Lord in Colossians 3.24, he says that we get an inheritance, a reward. I don't know about you, I want that. Me and my family, we serve here at our Journey Church. My high schooler right now is in the preschool room serving. My husband serves um, in children's ministry and up in the sound booth. And I myself serve in the kids' ministry, and I'm serving right now for my Journey Church family. I love to see all of you every Sunday. So God is um, good. Um, Ephesians 6, 7 says... When you serve, you're to serve wholeheartedly. See, we don't serve people, and we don't serve a building. We serve the Lord Jesus Christ. So use your gifts that he gives you and serve him because he wants to give you a reward. He has an inheritance for all of us, so we need to use our gifts. If you consider Journey Church your home church, use your gifts here. We need you. The church is the people. And we need the people to use their gifts here at Journey. I love you all. Thank you for joining.